Cue and Review, celebrating 40 years of audio production, welcomes you to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Sports Podcast, recorded from our studio in the Bishop Briggs Media Centre and by our volunteers working from home. Keep up to date with Cue and Review news via our Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, or Instagram, at Cue and Review, that's at sign, C-U-E, a-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W or get in touch with us directly by emailing information at qreview.com That's I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at sign C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M or by calling us on 0141 772 3979. Please like and share our podcast and give us constructive feedback. Evening Times Sport, July 9. Celtic urged to sign Newcastle Keeper. Report by Robbie Hanratty. As Celtic continue their preparations for the upcoming season, the club still faces a crucial decision in replacing their veteran goalkeeper Joe Hart, who announced his retirement from professional football at the end of the last campaign. Former Celtic midfielder Lubomir Moravcik has recommended that the reigning Scottish Premiership champions should consider bringing in Martin Dubravka as Hart's successor. Dubravka, who is also a vastly experienced shot stopper, has been linked with a move to Celtic this summer. The 35-year-old spent the second half of last season as Newcastle United's first choice keeper following an injury to Nick Pope. However, with Pope now recovered from a dislocated shoulder, Dubravka is expected to fall down the pecking order at St James's Park. Celtic's need for a strong and reliable number one goalkeeper has become evident since Hart's retirement. That means Dubravka's proven track record and wealth of experience in the Premier League could make him an ideal candidate to fill the void left by the ex-England international. Moravcik, having spent four years at Parkhead, between 1998 and 2002, believes his Slovakia counterpart would relish the opportunity should Brendan Rodgers' side come calling. Moravcik said, If this is a possibility, I have absolutely no doubts that Martin has the qualities required to play for Celtic. He is in his mid-thirties, and has great experience from playing in the English Premier League and for his country. I was in Germany at the Euros to support my country and Martin was brilliant. He is tall, makes important saves, and is comfortable with right foot and left foot. He makes good judgments on the park and gives the team proper security. I also believe Martin would have no problem coping with the pressure of playing for Celtic, We are talking about a highly experienced professional. The chance to play for Celtic and against Rangers and in the Champions League would be something that Martin would embrace and accept the challenge. If he wants to ask me about what it is like to play for Celtic, then I would recommend it to him. I had four brilliant and memorable years at Celtic and it would be lovely to see another Slovakian play for the club but we will need to wait and see what Brendan and the club will do. Meanwhile, John Hartson had told Manchester City to take it easy on Celtic when the English Premier League champions meet the Scottish Premiership winners on their United States tour later this month. The two will face off in North Carolina, 
the first meeting between the sides since 2016, when they clashed in a Champions League group stage match. Hartson, who spent five seasons at Celtic, has joked that Pep Guardiola's city should show some mercy against the Hoops during their pre-season exhibition match. The July 24 encounter will be a high-profile affair, with the reigning champions of England's top flight taking on the dominant force in Scottish football. Fans on both sides of the Atlantic will be eager to see how the two European heavyweights fare against each other in this summer friendly. Previewing the game on City's social media accounts, Hartson turned to Paul Dickhoff and said, It should be a great game. Obviously you've got the champions of England and the champions of Scotland. If City could take it easy a little bit on Celtic, that would help, because some of the players they've got is just incredible. I love watching Man City play. I think Celtic will go there. They will take a big crowd with them. I think it's a brilliant fixture seeing Celtic pitting their wits against the very best. It will be a really big test for them, but you never know. Some of their players will just be coming back to full fitness and you'll get players on the fringes getting an opportunity to impress as well. This glamour friendly will give supporters the opportunity to get a glimpse of their heroes in the United States and Hartson could not hide his admiration for the worldwide Celtic fan base and pointed out, I think Celtic are renewed for the fan base all over the world. Manchester City, with the success that they've had over the last 10 to 12 years, they are getting bigger and bigger, a lot more popular around the world, and I'm sure the stadium will be full with a brilliant atmosphere. As I said, I just think the talent that will be on show from both teams, Celtic have got some really good players, and Man City have just got so many world stars. So yes, I hope they take it easy on Celtic a little bit, but I'm sure Celtic will be as competitive as they can. Meanwhile, a forgotten £3.5 million Celtic ace is set for a second transfer through the loan clause. Forgotten Celtic's Alexandro Bernabe is set to move clubs for the second time this year. The 23-year-old left Celtic on loan in March to join Brazilian club SC Internacional. However, it is reported Bernabe, who signed for Celtic from Lanos for a fee in the region of £3.5 million, could make another move in August to head to Argentina. The defender's current loan deal runs until the end of 2024, but crucially can be ended sooner between August 1 and 7. Evening Times Sport July 9. Rangers warned they cannot allow Celtic to win another SPFL title. Report by Robbie Hanratty. In a stark warning to Rangers, former midfielder Pedro Mendes has stressed that the club simply cannot afford to throw away another Scottish Premiership title. With Celtic closing in on their 55th league championship, Mendes emphasised the importance of Rangers reclaiming their dominance. Said Mendes, one thing that Rangers fans are really proud of is their history and how many titles they have won. So Celtic being one away from 55 is a matter of concern. Rangers need to open up that gap again. The former Rangers star acknowledged the challenges facing the club, with key players like Borna Barisic and John Lundstrom departing. And he told Boyle Sports, there are a lot of things going on at Rangers at the moment. 
Mendes highlighted the team's mentality as a crucial factor, stating, To play for a team like Rangers is not enough to just be a good player. You need to have a very, very strong mentality, because every game has to be won. And the Portuguese midfielder warned that Rangers cannot afford to draw. No matter the pitch, no matter the opponent, you cannot afford even a draw. Every game has to be a win. They cannot afford to throw another title away. Mendes expressed hope that new manager Philippe Clement can lead Rangers to success, adding, hopefully, they settle down quickly and can win the Premiership again. It would be a massive, massive win for Rangers in the coming season. Ultimately, Mendes' message is clear. Rangers must learn from their past mistakes and maintain a relentless winning mentality if they are to reclaim their place at the top of Scottish football. Mendes was also quizzed on Philippe Clément's Ibrox tenure so far and acknowledged that the door should always be open for a potential return of Steven Gerrard, who had previously led the club to the league title. If things don't work out for the Belgian, Steven Gerrard did a good job at Rangers, so a return in the future is always possible, he said. With the job he did in winning the title, it means the door would always be open to a return later in his career. But at the moment, the board and the fans are keen on Philippe Clément. There has been a really good feeling about him since the moment he signed, and I think he needs to be allowed to prepare the team as he wants so he can win a title with Rangers. Report by Robbie Hanratty. Evening Times Sport, July 9. Scottish teen battles through at Wimbledon. Report by Will Jennings. Scott Charlie Robertson battled into the second round of the boys' singles at Wimbledon with a gutsy three-set triumph over German Max Schoenhaus. The Dundee-born 17-year-old ground out a 6-4-2-6-6-3 victory on court three to keep his SW19 dream alive. Robertson reached the second round last year after being awarded a wild card into the draw, but was beaten by the Brazilian eighth seed. And he's now advanced to the same stage with another impressive first round victory teeing up a tough-looking clash with Korean ninth seed Zhang Yang Kim next up. Robertson was also due to be in the boys' doubles action later, but will have to wait until this morning after more wet Wimbledon weather intervened on Monday night. Elsewhere, fellow Scott Jamie Murray successfully advanced to the second round of the mixed doubles with a comfortable straight set triumph alongside American Taylor Townsend. Murray, who lost his men's doubles first round clash in what marked partner and brother Andy's emotional farewell last week, triumphed 6 4, 7 6 on court two. Evening Times Sport, July 9. United States announce Ryder Cup captain. Report by Press Association. Keegan Bradley will captain the United States as they attempt to win back the Ryder Cup from Europe in 2025. Bradley will lead the Americans into battle in the 45th edition of the contest, which will take place at Beth Page Black in Farmingdale, New York from September 26 to 28. He was announced as the 31st United States Ryder Cup captain by PGA of America President John Lindert yesterday 
amid reports that 15-time major winner Tiger Woods had turned down the role. The 38-year-old said, I am incredibly honoured to accept this opportunity to captain the United States team at the 2025 Ryder Cup. I would like to thank the PGA of America Ryder Cup Committee for their trust in me as we embark on this journey to Beth Page Black. My passion and appreciation for golf's greatest team event have never been stronger. The Ryder Cup is unlike any other competition in our sport, and this edition will undoubtedly be particularly special given the rich history and enthusiastic spectators at this iconic course. I look forward to beginning preparations for 2025. Bradley made his Ryder Cup debut in 2012, and despite finishing with a 3 1 0 record, ended up on the losing side as the Europeans fought back from 10 6 down, heading into the singles to clinch a remarkable victory in the so-called miracle at Medina. He suffered the same fate two years later at Glen Eagles, as Europe retained the trophy with some comfort. Stuart Sink, the 2009 Open champion, and Fred Couples, who like Sink served as a vice-captain at last year's defeat in Rome, were also touted as candidates to succeed Zach Johnson but it was 2011 PGA Championship winner Bradley who ultimately got the nod. Linda said, I am proud and excited to name Keegan Bradley as captain of the 2025 United States Ryder Cup team. Keegan's past Ryder Cup experience, strong relationships and unwavering passion for this event will prove invaluable as he guides the United States team over the next year and a half. We are confident that with Keegan at the helm, the 2025 United States Ryder Cup team will compete at Beth Page with the same confidence and determination that has defined his career. The United States have tended to choose their captains at least 18 months in advance, but the relative delay for the upcoming edition is thought to have been because of protracted discussions with Woods. The former world number one, however, said at the United States PGA Championship two months ago that he may not be able to commit due to other off-course responsibilities. Woods said, I am dedicating so much time to what we are doing with the PGA Tour I do not want to fulfil the role of the captaincy if I cannot do it. What that all entails and representing Team USA and the commitments to the PGA of America, the players and the fans, I need to feel that I can give the amount of time that it deserves. Europe confirmed last November that Luke Donald would lead their team for a second term following their triumph in Rome. Evening Times Sport, July 10. Alistair Johnson frustrated after Canada Cup exit. Report by Robbie Hanrati. Alistair Johnston knows just how far Canada have come in a relatively short period of time. He has watched his national team qualify for the 2022 World Cup, rise up the FIFA rankings, and now has played 90 minutes in a Copa America semi-final defeat by Argentina. All this experience should be of benefit to Celtic, who will be competing in the New Look Champions League format this season, while aiming for more domestic dominance. Goals from Julian Alvarez and Lionel Messi ensured that Argentina's place in the final, where they will meet either Uruguay or Colombia, sending Johnson's men packing. 
Yet the 25-year-old Hoops ace admitted it was frustrating that Canada could not take their chances throughout the match, but was quick to reiterate just how big his country's rise has been to even be uttering the words of semi-final tournament disappointed. The Celtic fullback said, We cannot be too frustrated with the gap. It's the best team in the world. It's been producing players that have gone down in the pantheon of greatest of all time for a century now. So you cannot say that you're surprised by the gap. It is frustrating because now we're at that level where we can compete with these teams. And again, we created chances. And I think that the most frustrating part is that if you get one of those in the first half, maybe it's a different game. It's a very similar script to the first time we played them. They kind of scored one, and then they didn't create too much in the first half. And then we had a couple of big chances. Then they score that one, and then again, just a little lapse in concentration in the second half. And they get an easy one, and the game's really out of reach. And even then, we still had chances, but you can tell they were a lot more comfortable in their situation. So it's frustrating in that aspect, because we're getting so much closer, and again our rise has been rapid over these last couple of years. To think that you're even mad that we're getting knocked out in the Copa America semi-final by Argentina, but at the same time, that's what you want. You want to be frustrated. You want to have a feeling that we were there. We shared the pitch with them. We're not feeling that. We're feeling, I wish we could have a little more there. So that's the frustrating part for me. Report by Robbie Hanrati. Evening Time Sport, July 10. New documentary on first Hebridean Commonwealth swimmer. Report by Josh Carmichael. A new documentary is taking a deep dive into the life and career of the first Hebridean swimmer to compete in the Commonwealth Games, and it will air this month. Produced by Sunset and Vine, and airing on BBC Alapa, the programme follows the record-breaking athletic career of the professional swimmer Cara Hanlon, and will be around 45 minutes long. Titled Cara Hanlon, Dare to Dream, it will reveal all about the Hebridean swimmer's life, from her childhood growing up in Stornoway to training for the qualifiers for the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. The now four-time British champion was inspired to take up the sport from a young age after learning to swim in her local community pool in Tormoway. Speaking in the documentary, Cara said, I did a lot of other sports when I was younger, such as running, but swimming for me was the one that always stuck. I was taught to swim by some of the local lifeguards at the old Stornoway pool, and what I remember most was racing for badges that I could put on my swimsuit to show that I'd made it to 50 metres or to 100 metres. At the age of 14, Cara's competitive swimming career took a major step forward after a chance meeting with D.R. Morrison, a prominent Lewis-based swim coach. Cara said, I didn't want to go to cross-country one morning. And my mum said, OK, if you don't go to cross-country, go to swimming instead. So off I went swimming and I bumped into DR, and he basically asked me to be part of his group that he was developing for the Island Games. Cara goes on to detail the sacrifices her family often had to make for her swimming development in terms of both financial cost and time, and she continued, 
There were a lot of times where my parents would have to take time off work to take me on the ferry over to the mainland. And I think they were just willing to support me through that. And that just meant going to more and more competitions, going up and up the levels. Cara, now 27, has since achieved top swimming accolades in her professional athletic career. Last year she became the fastest female breaststroker in Scottish history for both 50 metres at the 2023 Glasgow International Swim Meet and 100 metres during the North District Open Championships in Aberdeen. In 2022, Cara achieved her childhood dream by becoming the first ever swimmer from the Western Isles to represent Scotland at a Commonwealth Games when she competed at Birmingham 2022. Reaching the finals of the 50 metres and 100 metres breast oak events, Cara also swam the final of the 4x100 metres women's medley relay, helping her team to a fifth place finish. Talking about swimming, Cara says, I think it kind of chose me. I feel it was kind of my destined path. Breaking Scottish records is something that I always have and I always cherish, and I have been the fastest woman in Scotland ever. Fiona Mackenzie, commissioning editor at BBC Alapa said, from a 12.5 metre pool to competing in the qualifying rounds of the Olympic Games, Cara has gone from a small pond to a big pool. She is one of Scotland's most decorated athletes, yet maintains a humble demeanour as she candidly opens up about her life growing up in Lewis in this new documentary. Report by Josh Carmichael Evening Times Sport July 10 Kilmarnock sign Rangers backup keeper Report by Robbie Hanratty Derek McInnes has bolstered his Kilmarnock squad with the addition of Robbie McCrory from Rangers on a two-year deal. McCrory came through the Rangers Youth Academy and earned his senior debut in a Europa League clash against Alash Kert three years ago. The 26-year-old goalkeeper was made to be patient for regular game time at the Scottish Premiership Giants and he told the club that he would like to leave this summer in search of regular football. He amassed just seven Rangers first team appearances since August 2021, finding himself behind Alan McGregor and then Jack Butland, and will now get the opportunity to compete for the number one jersey at Kilmarnock. The former Scotland under 21 short stopper becomes the second new arrival to the Rugby Park side, following the addition of striker Bruce Anderson. A club announcement read, Kilmarnock are delighted to announce the permanent signing of Robbie McCrory, who has joined from Rangers for an undisclosed fee. Robbie joins us at Rugby Park on a two-year contract. The 26-year-old Ayrshire native established himself as a key part of Rangers youth system with successful loan stints at Berwick Rangers, Morton, Queen of the South and Livingston. A regular feature internationally, Robbie has appeared for every age group for Scotland, ranging from the under 15s to under 21s over the course of his career, as well as a full Scotland call up. We are delighted to welcome him to Kilmarnock. The former Scotland Under-21 International will be available for immediate selection, pending SFA approval. Rangers broke the departure on their social media accounts and commented, Robbie leaves Rangers with the best wishes of everyone at Ibrox and Rangers Training Centre. Meanwhile, Celtic face potential departure of 2005-born talent Daniel Kelly. 
Kelly is Celtic's young prospect, but now he could be out of the way of the Scottish champions as a free agent in the next January transfer window. Despite Celtic's efforts to retain the player, there has been no agreement reached between the two parties so far. Many top European clubs have been closely monitoring Kelly's progress, including German Bundesliga side Bayer Leverkusen. However, Celtic have rejected all approaches for the talented youngster up to this point. The lack of a new contract agreement between Celtic and Kelly has raised concerns among the club's supporters who are eager to see the promising 18-year-old continue his development at Celtic Park. With his current deal set to expire on December 31, Kelly is free to negotiate a pre-contract agreement with other clubs. Kelly has made five first-team appearances for Brendan Rodgers' side to date, and he ensured his name was on every Celtic fan's lips when he scored an impressive goal on his senior debut as the double winners thrashed in D 7-1 in February. He has been on the verge of breaking into the first-team squad for some time, after catching the eye with his performances in the Lowland League, where he has impressed under the guidance of Celtic's B-team coaches, Stephen McManus and Darren O'Day. Having joined the club as an 18-year-old, Kelly has continued to develop his skills and has been a key player for Celtic in the recent UEFA Youth League campaigns. Last season, he found the back of the net against the likes of Lazio and Feyenoord, showcasing his goal-scoring abilities at the youth level. Furthermore, Kelly's talent has also been on display in the Premier League International Cup, where he netted it against Brighton. This performance has only added to the growing excitement surrounding the young midfielder, and his potential to make his mark on professional football. Report by Robbie Hanurati Evening Times Sport, July 10 No standout Premiership players worth signing by Celtic and Rangers. Report by Robbie Hanurati In a damning assessment of the current state of the Scottish Premiership, renowned football pundit and former footballer Alan McAnally has claimed that there are no players within the league that would be worth signing for Celtic or Rangers this summer. The former Scotland international went on to lament the apparent decline in the quality of Scottish players, particularly in the midfield and striker positions. McAnally's scathing verdict suggests that the country's top clubs may have to look beyond their borders to find the calibre of player needed to compete at the higher level. With the exception of Hart's Lauren Shankland, who finished as the Premiership's top scorer, McAnally believes there are few other players who would command significant transfer fees from the old firm clubs. He told Gambling.com, As much as Celtic and Rangers usually have their opportunity to take someone from another club that's done well, I don't think there was anybody that was really outstanding, so that the old firm would say, we really genuinely need to go and get them. Back in the day, there was a glut of unbelievably good Scottish players available for Aberdeen, Dundee United, the old firm, and coming down to England. I was actually just speaking to someone about this the other day, funnily enough, who lives down here in England. They said, where's all the Scottish strikers and midfield players? We were looking at some of the other strikers that don't exist anymore because we don't have them in the Scotland national team, someone that's scoring that amount of goals. You could say Lauren Shankland, of course, 
with him finishing top of the goal-scoring charts. But in terms of someone else wanting Lauren Shanklin, there's not really that many clubs interested in spending a lot of money to bring him in. I think that's the reason why Celtic and Rangers have cast their net to Europe more than just Scotland. And I think, as I'm saying it, it tells you the story that there's maybe not the same quality of football players in Scotland that there was. That's for sure. McAnally was asked about Celtic's summer recruitment plans and their lack of transfer activity to date when he replied, I started my career Air United and on Friday July 5 I was invited back as Air played Celtic in a pre-season game. I know it was to open one of the stands and it's very early on in the season, but I was little surprised that Celtic have not been more active in the transfer market. They were relatively successful last year in terms of obviously putting Rangers back in their place again, but I like to see business done early. I know that maybe some of the managers have been watching the Euros and thinking, I'll take him. I might get him for a good price. As of yet, Celtic have not been too busy. But that's got to change. New faces have to come in. People have to leave. Things have to be freshened up. And I'm sure they're on the job. It's just not been done yet. Report by Roddy Hanrati. Evening Times Sport. July 10. Keegan Bradley Raider Cup Captain Appointment Surprising. Report by Martin McMillan. Xander Schofel admits he was surprised by Keegan Bradley's appointment as Raider Cup Captain as the United States bid to recover from being throttled in Rome last year. Bradley will lead the home side at Bethpage Black in September 2025, after 15-time major winner right Tiger Woods reportedly turned down the role. The 38-year-old played on losing sides in 2012 and 2014 and was controversially overlooked for a wild card in 2023, with Zach Johnson's side going on to lose by five points. Schofield said of Bradley's appointment, it's surprising. He was speaking during a pre-tournament press conference at the Genesis Scottish Open. And he continued, You typically expect someone that's a little bit older to get selected as a captain. I think a lot of people were banking on Tiger to do it. He obviously has a lot on his plate. So Keegan expressed his love for the Ryder Cup publicly, which we all saw. And I'm sure he's over the moon and is going to do a great job. He is so laid back off the course. If you get him in like a dinner setting or something, he loves sports. He'll talk about sports all night long if you like. He's a very passionate individual. On the course, he is intense. That's just how he competes and how he is. I'm sure as a captain, he's going to have sort of a mixed bag. He won't be afraid and will get everyone going. I don't know if he's coached or captained any other teams in his life, whether it's his kids' teams or something like that, but when someone is really passionate about something, they usually do really well. Evening Times Sport, July 11. Alec Ferguson creates Euro's playlist for dementia. Report by Rosie Lewis Alex Ferguson has created his own Desert Island Disc Style playlist inspired by the Euros to support a dementia charity. Alex, 82 now, chose several songs from the post-war era which have associations with his Glaswegian adolescence as part of the playlist. Born in 1941, the football manager, known to United players as the boss, 
identified songs from growing up in Govan as being intrinsic to his sense of self as part of a project, Playlist for Life, which supports families living with dementia. Research found the benefits of creating a personal playlist included reduced anxiety, improved interpersonal connections, and even reducing the need for medication by as much as 80%. Ferguson is the UK's most successful football manager, and his playlist included Moon River from the film Breakfast at Tiffany's, released in 1961 and associated with his oldest friends. He also recalled performing 1951 hit It's All in the Game by Nat King Cole at a Christmas party held by Queen's Park when he was a 17-year-old. Said Alex, This song has a particularly strong memory. When I was 17 and playing for Queen's Park, they used to have an annual snooker competition, which I won. But when I went to receive the prize at the annual Christmas dance, they wouldn't give it to me unless I sang. And that was the song I sang. Also on his list was Dirty Old Town by the Pogues, which was written by folk singer Ewan McCall, a Manchester communist who was the father of Kirsty McCall and the brother-in-law of American folk legend Pete Seeger. Recalling the associations with Moon River, which was sung by Audrey Hepburn in the 1961 classic Breakfast at Tiffany's, Alex said, This is a song that when I'm with my longest and dearest friends from Govan, I always sing. Only they would have the patience to listen to me. Sir Alex got involved due to the Euros and said it was enjoyable and at times emotional to take part, naming the theme song from the 1939 film Gone with the Wind due to associations with a holiday with his late wife, Cathy. He also chose The Way We Were by Gladys Knight and the Pips, dating from 1974, and he said, Music has soundtracked many important moments in my life, and I'm pleased to support the charitable work of Playlist for Life, who use music to support people affected by dementia. It was enjoyable and at times emotional to look back on the music of my life, and I've been told about the many benefits music from the past can have for those affected by dementia. He also chose Danny Boy, describing it as one of the most sung songs in the world, and he continued, There is a host of famous singers who have sung it, and of course there are many different perspectives on the meaning of the song. One quite sad version is of a father taking his son to catch a train as he was heading off for war, and his father was so worried for him that he forgot to give him a hug. The son never returned. Michael Timmons, executive director of Playlist for Life, said, Football can form many special moments and memories in your life, and the Euros is a great excuse to reminisce with friends and family about these moments, even if you're from Scotland. Now is a great time to think about songs that have soundtracked your life, whether it be the songs sung in the terraces or other songs that remind you of special people and times in your life. Alex has helped create many of these special memories and to have his support is a tremendous privilege. His support has helped us improve the lives of countless families affected by dementia. By sharing songs from his personal playlist, he has demonstrated the ease of getting started on creating your own, something that can bring joy now but provide a lifeline in the future. We hope this encourages everyone to get started today. Report by Rosie Lewis
Evening Times Sport, July 11. Celtic youngster back after injury nightmare. Report by Joe Donnelly. Celtic ran out 6-4 winners against Queen's Park in an entertaining pre-season friendly last night on a night when Brendan Rodgers utilised his matchday squad to the fullest. All told, the manager introduced 12 players from the visitors' bench, including a raft of young talent, not least 18-year-old Francis Turley, who scored Celtic's sixth and final goal of the night. Another fringe player, who started alongside Stephen Welsh in the heart of the Hoops defence, was Dane Murray handed his debut in a UEFA Champions League qualifier against FC Mitchelland in 2021, when he had just turned 18. That was under former manager Ange Postecoglou. Murray was in and around the first team squad during the 21-22 campaign. A serious knee injury sustained while playing for the Celtic B team ruled him out for a year, with the defender returning to action in April 2023. Murray featured against Air United last week and started against Queen's Park, and afterwards the 21-year-old said, It was good to get minutes in the legs again. First half we did well, but I think we came into it in the second half, and in the first 15 minutes, showed what we can do. In pre-season, these are the games that you want to be tested. Queen's Park knew what they wanted to do. They were playing against Celtic, so they wanted to impose themselves in the game. It's going to be a long season, so starting off on the right foot was important. Meanwhile, Rio Hattie has made Celtic and Rangers passion admission. He insists he admires both sets of fans for that passion they show towards their clubs. Celtic's Japanese star hit the headlines when he revealed he wants to play in one of Europe's top five leagues eventually. But Hatati has admitted he is impressed by the intensity both Celtic and Rangers fans demonstrate towards their team, as he personally discovered in an interview in his homeland. He said, The atmosphere the day before and the day after a Celtic versus Rangers match is really different. You can see that everyone is cheering with pride. If it's Celtic, everyone has pride as a Celtic fan. If it's Rangers, everyone has pride as a Rangers fan. For example, there was a time when a Rangers fan came to repair my house. I could tell because he had the Rangers badge on his phone. I thought, oh, I hope this is all right. I got my house repaired and he said, I'm proud of Rangers. He also said, but I'm rooting for you, so keep up the good work. I think every team's fans and supporters have that kindness, even though they are proud of their team. Football culture is deeply rooted in Glasgow. I strongly feel that. I think it is special for me as a player to be able to play in the stadium and in that city. I haven't played for other teams in Europe, so I can't compare it, but I do feel that Glasgow is special. However, Hatati admitted his first experience of an old firm game two years ago showed the other side of what it meant to fans after he netted a double in a 3 nothing win. He recalled, When I stayed at the hotel the night before my first derby, I think Rangers fans set off fireworks outside the hotel, probably to keep us from sleeping. Then I scored in the game against Rangers the next day. The following day, I went out and a Rangers fan saw me driving and gave me the finger. That's when I realised I was playing in Europe. Evening Times Sport, 
July 11. Robert McIntyre admission after Scottish Open near miss. Report by Phil Casey. Robert McIntyre admitted he would struggle to forgive Rory McIlroy for snatching victory from his grasp if he failed to add the Genesis Scottish Open title to his CV. McIntyre had set a daunting clubhouse target last year thanks to a sensational birthday on the 18th, just the second of the day on the closing hole at the Renaissance Club, a strong winds made for testing conditions. However, overnight leader McElroy birded the par 3 17th to get on level terms and then hit a stunning two iron approach into the last, which has since been commemorated with a plaque, before holing from 10 feet to seal an improbable win. According to Ryder Cup statistics guru Eduardo Molinari, the probability that McElroy would birthday both the 17th and 18th was just 0.15%. McIntyre, with a hint of a smile, said yesterday, I don't think I'll ever forgive him if I don't win a Scottish Open. If it's not a major championship, this is the one I want. It was an incredible golf shot he hit. That was the winning shot, really. It was a good shot and it was a bit heartbreaking. Asked if he had spoken to McElroy about it when they were teammates on Europe's Ryder Cup side two months later, McIntyre added, I asked him one question at some point during the party. I had not spoken to him at all about it since the day it happened and I always wanted to ask him about the putt on 18. He thought he had missed it and it went in. So it just shows you, it doesn't have to be perfect for it to work out. McIntyre's decision to take up his PGA Tour card this season certainly did not look like working out earlier this year. The left-hander openly admitting he was struggling to adapt to being away from home before benefiting hugely from a three-week spell back in Scotland. The 27-year-old returned to the United States and finished 8th in the US PGA Championship before winning the RBC Canadian Open with his dad caddying, but will not be renewing the lease on his rental property in Florida when it runs out shortly. Said McIntyre, I'm still going to play over there. I'm just not going to pay a lot of money for a rental that I'm not staying in. I'll maybe take a house for maybe a month, two months, when I'm there. I've joined the Aislewirth, so that will always be a place to go and practice in the winter time. But there's nothing like home. Scotland, this is where I want to be. McIntyre admitted he was a bundle of nerves when he played alongside McElroy in the Scottish Open in 2019, but it will be a different story when the pair are joined by Ryder Cup teammate Victor Hovland for the first two rounds this week. And he said, Obviously, with the Ryder Cup being part of a team, I know him a lot better personally. I'm still miles away from being one of his close pals. But I feel if I ever need anything or ever want to ask a question, I can pick up the phone and ask. And Victor, I've known him since we were 14 or 15 years old, playing boys golf. This is probably the most calm I've been coming into a Scottish Open. It's not been as frantic. Things have been under control. Yes, my game has been up and down but it's been up and down my whole golfing life. But this is the one that, as a Scot, I really want. Last year I came really close, but there may not be another opportunity like that in my career playing golf. I've just got to try and play it as another event and give it my absolute best 
which I will do. Report by Phil Casey. Evening Times Sport, July 11. Robert McIntyre looks for home comforts in Scottish Open, reports Nick Roger. Take an ambo up the final hole of the Renaissance Club and you will stub your toe on a plaque honouring Rory McIlroy's imperious two-iron approach, which led to him pinching last year's Genesis Scottish Open title from our Ian Robert McIntyre. Prior to McIlroy clattering that cracker from just over 200 yards, McIntyre had assumed command with a gobsmacking approach of his own to the last in a closing 64. Forget a plaque, a McIntyre victory would have led to the commissioning of a commemorative bronze bust on the 18th ground. I don't think I'll ever forgive him if I don't win a Scottish Open, chuckled McIntyre, who lost out to McElroy by a single shot after a thrilling, rip-roaring finale in East Lothian. It was an incredible shot. That was the winning shot, but it was a bit heartbreaking. A lot has happened to McIntyre since that agonising near miss on home turf of a year ago. He has made a winning debut in the Ryder Cup, earned his playing rights for the PGA Tour, relocated to the USA, and claimed a breakthrough victory on the toughest circuit in the world at the Canadian Open. Earlier this week, he got to savour another new eye-opening experience as he hobnobbed with the great and the good in the Royal Box at Wimbledon. It's not a bad old life, eh? When I first got the invitation, I was going to say no, because this was uh, Scottish Open Week. But then I thought it was potentially a once-in-a-lifetime experience, said McIntyre, who was pictured supping a cup of tea with the kind of posh pinky that would have earned a nod of approval from His Royal Highness himself. Providing McIntyre didn't then slitter it down his tie, of course. And he added, I had front row seats. It was so fast, and seeing the athleticism in tennis made me realise that I had picked the right sport. All joking aside, McIntyre is looking to serve up something of an ace himself this week. For the home contingent, the Scottish Open continues to stir the senses and rouse the spirits. McIntyre, who is out in the marquee group with McElroy and Norway's Victor Hovland for the opening two rounds, is coming into the week in a tranquil, contented frame of mind, despite the hype and the heightened expectations. This is probably the most calm I've been, said McIntyre who admitted he was a bundle of nerves when he first got paired with McElroy as a rookie in the Scottish Open back in 2019. It's not been as frantic. Things have been under control. Yes, my game has been up and down, but it's been up and down my whole golfing life. This is the one title that, as a Scot, I really want. Last year I came really close but there may not be another opportunity like that in my career playing golf. I've just got to try and play it as another event and give it my absolute best, which I will do. Whatever happens this week, a sense of perspective will remain a valuable club in the bag. It's only a game after all. During yesterday's pro-am, for instance, he met Scott Stewart, the Campbelltown man who was diagnosed with motor neuron disease last year. It's heartbreaking when you actually see it up close, said McIntyre, who carries the Doddy Weir Foundation livery on his golf bag to aid the MND cause. He's speaking to you as a normal guy, and he's going through one of the worst things I could ever imagine. 
with two massive events on home soil over the next fortnight. The small matter of an open at Royal Turin is hurtling towards us. McIntyre couldn't be happier to be back on Scottish terrain. His struggles to adapt to the United States way of life have been well documented this season, but having found his feet and earned an exemption with that thrilling victory in Canada, the 27-year-old revealed that he will be adopting a new approach to his golfing travels. He said of his temporary base in the USA, My rent is up at my Florida house at the end of August, and I don't think I'll be getting it renewed, to be honest. I'm still going to play over there. I'm just not going to pay a lot of money for a rental that I'm not staying in. I'll maybe take a house for maybe a month or two when I'm there, but there's nothing like home. This is where I want to be. Report by Nick Roger Evening Times Sport, July 12 Europa League winners submit first bid for Celtic favourite. Report by Robbie Hanratty Matt O'Reilly was always going to be a man in demand this summer, following a season which saw him swoop multiple prizes at Celtic's Player of the Year awards. That was why it was such a shock when the midfielder was snubbed by Denmark for their Euro 2024 squad in June. Nevertheless, the suitors are still queuing up for the 23-year-old who scored in Celtic's 6-4 friendly win over Queen's Park on Wednesday. Reports claim that Europa League holders Atalanta have now submitted an official proposal to sign the Dane. The Serie A outfit are prepared to lose Toon Coop Miners, who has been chased by Juventus, and O'Reilly could be a ready-made replacement to help spearhead their return to the Champions League. However, there is intense competition to land at the Danes' services, with English Premier League clubs also believed to be circling. Southampton are thought to have tabled a £20 million offer, but it could take a more lucrative bid for Brendan Rodgers to allow his star man to depart Celtic Park. O'Reilly is under contract at the Scottish Premier Champions until 2027. After Celtic rejected Atletico Madrid's attempts to lure O'Reilly away from the UK last January, the player admitted the speculation around his future did have an effect on him. And he said, If I'm being completely honest, the first two or three games after the transfer window mentally it was a slight challenge because I felt somewhat of added pressure on my shoulders just slightly, but then I realised I didn't really know why I was putting extra pressure on myself. I didn't really need to change anything. I kind of came away from that and focused on what I bring to the team. It clicked back into place again. Each season, regardless of it going well, it will still pose a different challenge. Report by Robbie Hanratty Evening Times Sport, July 12 Five players to watch at the Open Golf Championship Report by PA News Agency Brian Harman will defend his title when the 152nd Open Championship takes place at Royal Turn from July 18 to 21. Harman, who won by six shots at Royal Liverpool last year, failed to qualify for the Open the last time it was staged at Turin in 2016, when Henrik Stenson lifted the claret jug following an epic duel with Phil Mickelson. The Press Association news agency has now picked out five players to watch in this year's final major championship. 
Rory McIlroy. All eyes will be on McIlroy to see how he reacts to the gut-wrenching events of June's United States Open when he held a two-shot lead late in the final round but bogeyed three of the last four holes at Pinehurst to finish one behind Bryson DeChambeau. McElroy famously bounced back from his collapse in the final round of the 2011 Masters by winning his first major in the United States Open two months later and did finish joint fifth at Turin in 2016, albeit a long way behind Stenson. Bryson DeChambeau DeChambeau sealed his second United States Open title with a brilliant up and down from a bunker on the 72nd hole and has been in superb form in this season's majors, finishing sixth in the Masters and second in the United States PGA Championship, where it took a major record of 21 under par from Xander Schofield to get over the line has recorded just one top 10 at St Andrews in 2022 in six open appearances to date. Tyrell Hatton finished alongside McElroy in a tie for fifth in 2016, although he is the first to acknowledge that Stenson and Mickelson were in a league of their own that week. Won his first LIV golf event by six shots in Nashville in June, a week after finishing 26th in the United States Open, following a costly closing 77. Finished ninth in the Masters and is a two time winner of the Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship. Scotty Schoffler a tie for 41st in the United States Open was Scheffler's worst finish since he was 45th in the CJ Cup in October 2022 and he followed that by claiming his sixth win of 2024 seven days later by beating Tom Kim in a playoff for the Travelers Championship. The two-time Masters champion will be making just his fourth open appearance at Turin, having finished eighth on his debut in 21 and just outside the top 20 in each of the last two years. Brian Harman Harman will bid to become the first back-to-back -back winner of the Open since Podrick Harrington in 2008 and has enjoyed a quietly impressive year including a tie for second in the Players' Championship at TPC Sawgrass. One of two missed cuts this season came in the Masters, but the left-hander finished 26 in the United States PGA Championship and 21st in the United States Open. Report by Press Association. Evening Times Sport, July 12. Rangers boss Bennett apologises to fans. Report by Robbie Hanratty. In a statement issued by Rangers Football Club, Chairman John Bennett has announced that the club is in the final stages of negotiations with the Scottish FA to secure Hampden Park as its temporary home until the Ibrox works are complete. Bennett apologised to supporters who have been demanding an update on where their team will play with the Scottish Premiership season just around the corner and the 61-year-old has promised to provide a more detailed record later this month. Bennett said, First, I would like to apologise on behalf of the club for the uncertainty that this delayed project has caused to our season ticket holders, hospitality clients, partners and the wider support of this football club. The number of variables in this situation has made it extremely difficult to bring the one thing we all crave, certainty. Nevertheless, we are closing in on the most immediate solution 
a suitable venue at which to fulfil our fixtures and house our support. While the ongoing delay means that the club is unable to fix a date for our return to Ibrox, we anticipate that this will become clearer upon delivery of the necessary materials to Glasgow. Rangers thank the Scottish FA and the SPFL for their strong support in working to this solution. The club wholeheartedly appreciates the continued patience of our supporters while we work through this most trying of situations. I intend to give a fuller personal update by the end of July. Rangers' first home game of the league season is against Motherwell on August 10, and after a disappointing end to their previous campaign, Philippe Clement will be desperate to limit any upheaval and hit the ground running. Evening Times Sport July 12 Trophy older than World Cup now on display in Glasgow Report by Sanda Suresh A historic trophy older than the World Cup and European Championships is now on exhibit in Glasgow. The Durand Cup will be open to public viewing at the Royal Highland Fusiliers Museum on Sucky Hall Street. It was introduced in 1888 by diplomat Henry Durand and was initially open to British and Indian Army regiments to improve soldiers' fitness and morale. Ashlyn Ball, museum curator at the Royal Highland Fusiliers, said, The Durand Cup is more than 40 years older than the World Cup and 70 years older than the European Championships, and is a real hidden gem in the centre of Glasgow. People think army museums are about uniforms, guns and medals, but the Durand Cup shows a different side of soldiering, the sporting side, the social side, the human side. The Silver and Ebony Trophy remains a key sporting event in India, with clubs competing for it each year. Alex McGill, another museum curator, said, To show you how important the trophy is, FIFA borrowed it to show in their museum. That is an indicator of how highly valued it is in football. The Highland Light Infantry won the cup so often, the organisers decided they could keep it, which is why it's in our museum. People should come and see it. It's such an important artefact and very unusual for a military museum. Report by Sanja Saresh. Evening Times Sport, July 15. Magical McIntyre brings a Scottish Open title home. Report by Nick Roger. Well, have you picked your jaw up from the floor yet? In a quite staggering finale to the Genesis Scottish Open at the Renaissance last night, Robert McIntyre became the first Scot in 25 years to win the domestic showpiece. You can breathe out now. As Sir Alex Ferguson did not quite gasp, golf, bloody hell. A year after being pipped on the final green by Rory McIlroy's barnstorming blitz, McIntyre conjured the kind of finish that grandstands were invited for to edge out the gallant Adam Scott by a single shot on 18 under and fulfil his destiny. It was another magical moment in a young career that continues to be packed full of them. As the clock tick-tocked towards 8pm, these pesky United States television broadcast times are a real menace. The national anthems over at the Euro 2024 final in Germany were just about to get tootled out. McIntyre's birthday putt of some 20 feet on the 18th for a 67 
ensured that the fleur of Scotland blared around the Renaissance. No Scotland, no party. The knees up could begin. I think I lost my voice after the scream on that pole, Bean McIntyre, who roared himself hoarse amid emotional delirious scenes that will live long in the memory. I'm going to celebrate this one hard, added the reigning Canadian Open champion, who became the second Scot to win on the tour in a week after Ewan Ferguson's victory in Germany last Sunday. We'll pitch up to the Open when we pitch up to the Open. McIntyre is pencilled in for a pre-Open press conference in the Royal Troon Media Centre today. They may just have to do it from his bed. There's no way I'll be there by 3pm, he chuckled. In this game, you need a bit of luck. And my goodness, McIntyre, who had trundled in a raking birdie putt of 40 feet on the 14th to give himself hope, got a mighty slice of it just when things seemed to be slithering towards an anticlimax. On a topsy-turvy afternoon of fluctuating fortunes at the sharp end of affairs, the Oban lefty's wayward drive on the par 5 16th buried itself in the knee-high hay down the right-hand side of the fairway. It didn't look good. During an extraordinary fortuitous episode, however, McIntyre discovered a sprinkler head nestling in the thick stuff after taking a practice swing and was given a free drop following much humming and hawing. He'll probably need to donate half of his £1.2 million first prize to the golfing gods. Look, I got a bit of luck on 16, he said. I'm shouting and I'm swearing when I'm getting up to the ball because I know that that's my chance to really make birthday coming in. I got over the ball, looked at it thinking, I'm in a bit of trouble here. I might manage to move it maybe 100 yards. I couldn't believe when I heard the spring under my foot where my shoe spike was at and I'm like, no way. It was covered. I got lucky. It was meant to be. From 247 yards away, the Scot clattered a roaring six iron approach to within six feet to set up the most unlikely eagle opportunity. McIntyre grabbed it with total authority and rolled in the subsequent putt. Rory McElroy got a plaque on the Renaissance Club's 18th to commemorate his two-iron approach to the final green last year. Presumably they'll be erecting a marble statue in the 16th rough to immortalise McIntyre's wondrous whack. That eagle propelled him into a share of the lead with Scott, who was playing in the match ahead. Suddenly the title was back in his sights and a challenge that appeared to be petering out was reignited. Up front, Scott, the former Masters champion, who was aiming for his first tour victory since 2020, set the clubhouse target with a 67 for 17 under. The Australian could only sit in the recording hut, twiddle his thumbs, and wait to see what McIntyre would do up the last. He wasn't the only one on tenterhooks. The home tartan-tinged galleries must have been nibbling their nails into callous stumps as he unleashed a drive, then plonked a wedge onto the green. Unlike last year, when McIntyre had to look on helplessly to see what McElroy would do, he had his fate in his own hands. He seized the moment with grand aplomb, and his ball seemed to be soaked into the hole by the collective will of East Lothian. It was a joyous moment. I actually had a tear in my eye before I hit the putt, admitted McIntyre, 
as he reflected on the magnitude of the occasion. I had to go to Mike, my caddy, to get my water and try to reset, but I was getting emotional and had to say, you've still got a job to do here. The job was a good one though. McIntyre had been two behind overnight leader Ludwig Aberg going into the final day, but the closing round was something of a slow burner. It certainly caught fire on the run-in. I said to Mike when we walked off at 10, 16 or 17 could win this, said McIntyre, who demonstrated once again his never-say-die attitude. No one was getting away. No one was making a move. The one thing I can do is give 110%, and that's what I've done. I took the one chance I got on 18, and it's just my week. With Scott, the runner-up, fast-finishing Frenchman Romain Langasque claimed third with a 64, while Aberg drifted back into a tie for fourth after a 73. It was all about McIntyre though. Next step, the Open. And he said, how do I come down from this? I don't think I will. I think I will just try and ride the wave to the Open. We'll see him there, whenever that may be, says Nick Roger. Evening Times Sport, July 15. Scotland ladies must qualify for Euros, says Alison McConnell. It started with rancour and recrimination, but as it comes to an end, Scotland women's European Championship campaign has proven to be of a restorative nature. In April, when the team kicked off their Euros with a goalless draw against Serbia, whom they now face at Firhill tomorrow night as they conclude their campaign, Pedro Martinez Loza was so irked at the questioning of results that he queried whether or not there was a private agenda at play. The draw against the Serbs was the culmination of a sequence of results that had stretched to eight games without a competitive win, a run that had come on the back of a dispiriting and winless Nations League campaign. If there was an unease around the squad and the direction they were going in, it has now dissipated with how the team have performed after stepping down a level. The woeful Nations League display meant a relegation into Group B2 a move that has proved to offer some sanctuary. Scotland's win over Slovakia on Friday night as a biblical storm suspended the game for 40 minutes ensured that they stayed top of their group with just one game remaining, virtue of a better goal difference of three over Serbia as they look to consolidate that place ahead of the autumn playoffs. Friday's win was more than just the points and the place at the top. The fourth successive victory offered a very different sequence of results than the one they took into the campaign. It is the first time in six years that they have enjoyed such a run and has been a balm to the wounds left by the Nations League and the failure to qualify for last year's World Cup. While the optics all look good, the issue is that the gulf between elite level and Scotland has not gone anywhere. Martinez Loza's side will discover their playoff fate when the draw is made on Friday for their autumn games, and these will offer another potential exposure to top level teams. Martinez Loza suggested on Friday that his side have proved to everyone that they are a team. His reference came on the back of the disruptions they have faced against Israel at Hamden when kickoff was delayed after a protester had chained themselves to a goalpost, and then again on Friday night when they spent 40 minutes wondering whether the game would be abandoned 
in the Nitra. But the real challenges that this team have come through have been on the park. They doomed the World Cup playoff when Ireland progressed to Australia seemed to haunt this side for months afterwards. The failure, a shrill accompaniment into the Nations League. The playoffs will be a chance for Scotland to show exactly how they have progressed and learned, because there is little doubt that they will be back into elite territory. They will benefit from these past few months, from the restoration of confidence, and from a belief that comes only through winning games. How far that goes remains to be seen. Certainly, though, there will be a major benefit come autumn and the playoffs getting underway, and that is the return of Caroline Weir and Emma Watson. The latter is an exciting young talent who offers something a little different, but Weir can generally be bracketed as Scotland's world-class performer. The 29-year-old is set to resume full pre-season training with Real Madrid before the slow return to proper match fitness. It is unquantifiable what Scotland missed without Weir. It would be remiss to place qualification for next year's Euros squarely on one player, but Scotland's hand is immeasurably stronger with her back in the mix. Attendances these past few months have shone a light on a lethargy around the women's game, with numbers concerningly low. A major tournament is the quickest way to inject an immediate energy and buzz around the squad. And another thing, Pedro Martinez Loza described Maya McCauley as a street player last week as he called the 17-year-old into the senior Scotland setup, The Rangers kid had an exceptional debut season last term, deservedly claiming the PFA Young Player of the Year award. It would be fantastic to see her given a chance against Serbia at Firhill tomorrow. Whether she makes her debut or not, there is no doubt that she will have some involvement in the coming months. And finally, Glasgow City have advertised two communications and marketing jobs this week as they look to refresh things behind the scenes. The salaries on offer for a club that is entirely self-sufficient and does not have the resources that come from an affiliation to an established men's club are competitive and fair for the roles they are looking for. Interestingly, they are also offering fairer pay than some men's top flight clubs for similar roles, reports Alison McConnell. That concludes this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Sports Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Q and Review and to tell your friends about our service 